we are starting a brand new series, as you heard in the video announcements, called More Than Able. We have a God, everybody, that is more than able to do whatever he wants to do. Do you really believe that? I mean, he is a miracle-working God. I believe the same God who did the miracles in the Old Testament, did them in the New Testament, can do them in your life today. I firmly believe that he is more than able. I love this out of Psalm. It says, what God is as great as our God? You're the God who performs miracles. You display your power among the peoples. Our God is a miracle-working God. In fact, in the Gospels alone, I count 37 miracles that Jesus performed. And they're all different varieties. So miracles of provision, of protection, of deliverance from demoniacs, miracles over nature, miracles of healing, which we're talking about today. By the way, um, Jesus didn't just do 37 miracles. He did lots and lots of miracles. In fact, John ends his gospel this way. Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose even the whole world would not have enough room for the books that would be written. Uh, so our God does anything he wants to do, and we need to believe that and press into that over the next few weeks. Uh, I think miracle kind of gets a bad rap and actually loses some of its power in 2024 for a couple of reasons. One is that some people just, they, they think that God is able to do miracles, but he wouldn't do a miracle for me. You got to erase that mentality. And then we've kind of lessened what a miracle is. Like Pastor Reed, I was at Walmart yesterday, and, and the parking lot was packed with cars, and I couldn't find a space. I'm going up and down the rows, and then I found one at the very front. It's a miracle. No, that's a coincidence, okay? Somebody left when you pulled in. Shocker, right? It's not a miracle. A miracle. What is a miracle? A miracle is when God in heaven gets involved on earth. That's a miracle, when God in heaven gets involved on earth. So if you go into Walmart and it's packed with cars and the waters part, the cars part like the Red Sea, right? That's a miracle. Only God could do that. And so we're looking at miracles. God, I want to see you do miracles. I want to ask the question, how many of you, when you think about yourself or somebody that you love, you could use some God involvement? Like I need a miracle in my life or with somebody that I know and love. Come on, raise them high. Yeah, lots and lots of hands. Me too. Second question, how many of you believe that God can take a sick person and make them well? Believe that. Yeah. I absolutely, unequivocally believe that with you. God, in fact, the miracle God does most often in the Old and New Testaments is the healing of other people. Why? And, and in fact, biblical scholars believe that it's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, not 37, of miracles of healing that Jesus performed in his 33 years on earth. Uh, healed blind eyes, unstopped deaf ears, made the lame to walk, and raised the dead. Two of my favorite healing stories, one of them I talked about in January, is the story of Eutychus. So Paul is preaching a message, the Apostle Paul's preaching a message, and he's getting a little long-winded. Have you ever gotten bored listening to a sermon at another church? Anybody? Okay. <laughs> Definitely not here, right? So, <laughs> But he's getting a little, he's going on and on and on and on. And so Eutychus is sitting in the window and he starts to nod off and he falls out of the third story window, dies. And thank goodness, Paul goes down, lays his hands on him, calls on the name of the Lord and his life. He comes back from the dead. Uh, I, I, he wasn't married. Paul wasn't married, but I'd love for him to go home and have that conversation. How was church tonight, honey? Oh, my sermon killed, babe. It killed. Uh, the most controversial healing in the entire Bible is when Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law. Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law, which is why many biblical scholars believe that Peter denied Christ three times. <laughs> I'm kidding, it's a joke. All right, some of you really love your mother-in-law. You're like, that's not funny, that's not funny. I do love my mother-in-law. All right, so we're talking about miracles, miracles of healing. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than, come on, he is more than able. All we ask, all we imagine according to his power that is at work within us. We got a big God who can do big things. So I think I always believed in miracles, but I never really saw miracles. And then I was a part of a church in Austin, and I was an associate pastor there, and the pastor did a series like the one I'm doing over the next few weeks on miracles. And so people started coming down, and they're asking for some pretty crazy things from our prayer partners and from the church staff. And they're asking us to pray. And we're praying, and I'm telling you, there's things that scientifically, medically, I, 
I can't tell you how they happened. It was a movement of God. God got involved on earth, and it just built my faith. And so I'm praying with more faith, and God started doing more things. I'm telling you, it was a movement of God in Austin, Texas. And I'm believing that we're going to have one of those right here in Snyder, Texas. Come on, who's with me? We want to see that God move in this place within these walls over the next few weeks. And that's the city of Snyder, the county of Scurry, and the surrounding areas. Go, what is happening down there at Colonial Hill Baptist Church? This is Miracle Month. This is Miracle May. God's going to do some amazing things. I really believe that. Now, I also know that sometimes you can pray for something. How many of you have ever prayed for someone to get healed and they didn't get healed? Okay, me too. And that's kind of confusing, right? Because you pray, God healed them, and then I pray this time and they get healed. The baby gets healed. I pray this time and the baby doesn't get healed. So why do you heal this baby and not this baby? God, you healed my back and and the lower pain that I had in my back, but you let a a young mother die of cancer. And when those things happen, they can shake you and they can rattle you and they can unsettle your heart. God, I believe that you can and I know that you do, but why didn't you heal my daughter of depression? God, we prayed and we prayed and we prayed for my grandmother to overcome pneumonia and yet she died. I don't understand that. And when those things happen, you can start to develop some bad theology of God's not real, right? God, you must not be real. That God doesn't care. And that's just, nothing could be further from the truth. So today what I want to do is I want to reconcile when God says no. And at the same time, believe, I know you can Often you do, but when you don't, how do, I, how do I manage that? And hopefully build your faith so we can see God do some amazing things in the weeks to come. That's, that's my goal. Here's the foundation I want to build the whole thing on is that God heals, but he doesn't heal everyone all the time. And you know that's true. Those are your first two blanks, by the way. God heals. He doesn't heal everyone all the time. And you know that because you prayed for somebody and they didn't get healed. But maybe you don't know that this happened to men and women in Scripture, too. People that were faithfully following Jesus, and they didn't always get their healing. A couple of examples. Uh, One of them was Trophimus. Trophimus was this guy who was on Paul's third missionary journey, and he got sick. And apparently God did not heal him, could heal him, often does heal him, didn't heal him. Paul says, Erastus stayed in Corinth, and I left Trophimus sick in Miletus. Okay, well... Not only did God not heal him, Paul said, I left him. I had to keep doing my business, so I just left Trophimus there. Same thing happens to Timothy, Paul's protege, Timothy. And Paul tells Timothy, stop drinking only water and use a little wine because of your stomach and frequent illnesses. In other words, God can heal you, often does heal you, but because he didn't heal you, just use whatever you need just to subsidize the pain, right? Just to just to antidote yourself. Just drink a little wine, Tim. It's fine. Maybe one of the greatest examples of God not healing somebody is the apostle Paul himself. So Paul had this thorn in his flesh, and we don't know what it was. Biblical scholars argue maybe it was bad eyesight, maybe it was some temptation. We really don't know. But he pleaded. I'm talking about pleaded. In the Greek, it's the word, uh, this ongoing, persistent pursuit of God, like three seasons of God. Please, I've seen you do this thing. I've seen you do things greater than this. Do this in me. Take it away. Take away this thorn. I can be so much more effective for the gospel, for your name. Just take it away. And for whatever reason, God says, no. No, 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 I'm not going to do this, Paul. In this instance, my grace is going to be sufficient for you. So how do you reconcile that God can often does, but doesn't always, and build your faith to continue to pray and seek God for miracles. Let's answer this question first. Why does God not do miracles? That'd be a good question for us to answer. Why does God not do miracles? And there are three reasons. Why would Jesus not do miracles? First, Jesus wasn't going to prove himself. He's not going to prove himself. I don't know if anybody's like me. When I was younger, I'd say, God, if you do this, then I'll serve you all my life. I'll give my life to you if you'll just do this one thing. Anybody pray a prayer like that? That just me, right? And he he just doesn't play that game. I wish that he did. He doesn't. (laughs) So uh, It would be so much easier if he did. He doesn't. I'm not going to prove myself. In Scripture, Mark 8, the Pharisees came and began to question Jesus. What was their motive? What was the motive of their heart to test him? They ask for a sign from heaven, and Jesus just sighs. 
<sighs> I'm not an illusionist. I'm not gonna do magic tricks. I, why does this generation ask for a sign? Truly, I tell you, no sign is gonna be given to you. I'm not gonna prove myself. I'm God. I don't have to prove myself. I know who I am. I hope you figured that out. All right, so he's not gonna prove himself. Second reason Jesus might not do a miracle is he wasn't gonna interfere with God's ultimate plan. Now, I wanna show you an example of this where God does a miracle, Jesus does a miracle, and in the very next moment, doesn't. Could do both. He does one, doesn't do the other. So if you remember the night he was betrayed, Judas, one of his disciples, betrayed him. And Judas gives him a kiss to cue the Roman soldiers, this is the guy, arrest and crucify him. Well, Peter, whom I like, gets ticked off. And so he goes, nah, uh no, not my Jesus. And he takes out his sword, and I think, I don't know for a fact, but I think he was swinging for one of the guard's heads, and he missed, and he just cut off the guard's ear. That's what I think happened. Uh, good intentions, bad aim. And so the ear falls off this guard. And Jesus, I'm kind of riding into the story a little bit, but I can see him going, Peter, 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 Peter. That is not what I want you to do. I have this under control. Give me the ear. Where's the ear? Where, find the ear. It's in the bush. Get the, get the ear out of the bush. Here, give it to me. That is disgusting. There's pandemonium, blood everywhere. Here, come here, come here. And he puts it back on Malchus, the Roman guard's head, and, and does a miracle. In the very next moment, Jesus said, I could do this, but I'm not going to do that. Don't you realize I could ask my father for thousands of angels to protect us, to come and swoop me away, and he would send them instantly. That'd be a miracle. By all these Roman guards arresting Jesus, and the angels could come and make a big scene and take us away. But if I did that, how would the scriptures be fulfilled that describe what must happen now? He goes, yeah, I could pray that God saves me, but then how is he going to save mankind? I know I have to go to the cross. I know I have to get arrested. I know I have to die for the sins of the world. And so I'm going to say no, yes to this miracle, no to this miracle, knowing that God's ultimate plan is in place. So sometimes we're praying for something. We're like, God, why don't you? And he goes, I've got something better. What could be better than this? I just, you're going to have to trust me. That's the second reason. And the third reason that God or Jesus won't do miracles that I see in Scripture is Jesus wasn't going to do a miracle where there was no faith. Again, faith is a pretty big deal to God. Having some faith. Faith is being certain of what we hope for and sure of what we do not see. I, I want to have some faith. Faith, right? And uh, one time Jesus is, is preaching in his hometown, and there's a bunch of people who are familiar with him, and they're like, isn't that Mary and Joseph's boy? Yeah, that's the carpenter's son, right? That's the guy who in Sunday school knew all the answers, the teacher's pet. And because of his familiarity and because of their unbelief, he couldn't do any miracles among them except place his hands on a few sick people and heal them. In other words, I wanted to do more, but because you didn't have faith, I couldn't do more. So faith is necessary. In fact, let me give you the opposite of that. There, there are a few instances, I'm going to give you three, that I can think of just off the top of my head, where somebody had faith, got a miracle. So you know the story if you've been in church for any length of time about the woman who had the issue of blood for 12 years. And she's seeking the Lord and seeking the Lord. She's gone to the doctor. She's exhausted all of her resources. She can't find a cure. But she said, if I could just touch the edge of his clothes, if I could hold the hem of his garment, I might be healed. So one day, Jesus is going through a crowd, and she sees him, and she reaches for him, and Jesus feels power leave him. And he says, who touched me? And she said, it's me. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. 12 years, can't find an answer, don't know what the doctors have to say, I'm going to heal you because of your faith. Another time, there's a guy with leprosy, which was a highly communicable skin disease, and he falls down and just starts worshiping Jesus, and Jesus looks at him and says, rise and go, your faith has made you well. Yet another time, a blind guy, can't even see him, he goes, I can't see you, but I can hear you, I know you're there, have mercy on me, Lord, and Jesus says, go, your faith has healed you. Immediately, he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. So having faith, mustering up some faith, faith's a pretty big deal to God. It's a big deal to God. In fact, when Jesus was on earth, the only thing 
that ever amazed Jesus according to scripture? The only thing in the Bible that amazed the creator about us the created was faith. Two extreme examples of that. One in Matthew 8, there's a centurion, a Roman centurion, who had a servant sick at home. And he said, Lord, I can't, I'm not even worthy to have you come under my roof, but I know that you can heal him. You don't have to see him. You don't have to touch him. You don't even have to walk that direction. I know with the word you can heal him miles away. And so Jesus does. The man gets healed. And Jesus heard this. He was amazed. Jesus, amazed at his creation, and said to those following him, Truly I tell you, I've not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. And the opposite of that, one time again, he's in his hometown where a prophet is without honor, and he was amazed at their lack of faith. If Jesus were to have a conversation with you and go, you know what, you amaze me, would he be amazed at your great faith or your lack thereof? It's a good question. He wants you to have some faith. Faith's a big deal to God, especially when it comes to miracles. In fact, Jesus himself said, truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, I'm talking about the smallest seed. If you have that kind of faith, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Just have a little bit of faith. If you, in other words, if you've got a mountain, if you've got something that seems so insurmountable to overcome in your life, just muster up some faith, and that moves the heart of God to get involved in your earthly situation and move or overcome that mountain on your behalf. If you don't believe me, turn your attention to the screens. I'm Russell, and this is JJ. Uh, we're the Walls. Uh, we've been going to Colonial Hill for about four years now, maybe. I don't know. COVID so, kind of messed yeah. that up. Yeah, it did. Um, we've got four kids at home, one older one that lives in Fort Worth, uh, Alex, and then Ramsey. Uh, Y'all probably all see her leading worship quite a bit. And uh, then Sawyer is 11, Timber's five, and Dutton's four. Um, terrible retirement plan there. Um, <laughs> we want to share the story of what God did in our lives. Yeah. I knew something was wrong. I didn't feel good. And I woke up early one morning, and I was coughing up blood. So we went, went into Snyder. Uh, they, were, they were awesome. They got us in and instantly got her back for some x-rays and stuff and said she had blood clots in her in her lungs waited about 30 minutes say like we can't get you in anywhere in lubbock we're gonna try abilene about 30 minutes later we're flying you to abilene that's where i really don't remember a lot she was sitting up and i can tell she's like starting to not comprehend what's going on they took her blood pressure and it was like i don't even know what the number was it was and he goes no that can't be right take it again they take it again yeah and at that time, I was standing at the foot of the bed, and she just leans back, and her eyes rolled back in the back of her head. And he flips the switch, sirens start going off, and there's some lights going off, and he's barking orders, and it's total chaos, controlled chaos on their end. And I'm just sitting there going, man, I mean, like, we were just talking perfectly fine. He jumps across, straddles the bed, is telling him to get the paddles ready, and he starts doing compressions, and I just fell apart. <laughs> and what seemed like two hours was just a matter of a few minutes, and they come wheeling her out, they're going to ICU, and I'm colorblind, and I cannot explain how dark purple she was and uh, they just wheel her out and I'm I don't even know what to do I'm praying that's all I can do I don't, I don't even know how long it was 20-30 minutes before a doctor comes out and says okay we've got her stabilized he said, you wouldn't believe how amazing she's doing after she was in cardiac arrest for 14 minutes. And I'm like, what? This is, this is the lady that I ask any kind of medical question. I'm like, cardiac arrest? He's like, yeah, she was dead for 14 minutes. We had to keep her alive for 14 minutes. 
And there again, I lost it. But he's gone. You won't, you, you can't believe where she's at to where she, she, she had been. I'm like, okay, you know. Um, in that time, I probably did what anybody would have done, you know, make some agreements with God. <laughs> I'll do whatever. I told him. I do remember after we came through the ICU, I said, if you need somebody, take me. Don't take her, take me. And uh, I think it was me and Reed, maybe, were in the back after she had been moved. We talked about audibly hearing God's voice, if you've ever heard God's voice or whatever. And, and, and I don't know if God's probably spoke to me every day. I just wasn't listening. And I'm not going to say that I heard his voice. But when she opened her eye, and I just had something tell me, watch what I can do. And I just felt it. And my tears went from scared to just joyous and in awe. Because from that moment on, it was just as, as quickly as she went down, she was just fighting everything back, right back. <laughs> Anyways, when the doctors come around, they're saying, you know, she, we changed this, she's doing this, we're doing that, they've done this, and a doctor might chime in and say, have we tried this or whatever, and they're all just kind of working together, and this lead doctor says they had ran a bunch of tests and did a Doppler and, and a chest x-ray and all this stuff, which, mind you, you know, we're fighting, we, we, we have no idea what caused her heart to stop, but we're fighting uh, the blood clots in the lungs and she says something about you know uh, after no pulmonary embolisms and me I don't have her to ask what that is I'm like hold on what do you mean and they said well we uh, we didn't find any blood clots and, I, and of course the first thing that kind of made me nervous is oh my god they're not in her lungs anymore and I'm like so what happened and they said there's no blood clots I'm like in her lungs no in her whole body and she goes, we can't really explain that. And I said, I can. I said, you want to hear about fire God? Look at what he's doing. And they kind of just looked at me. And I was crying at the same time, too. Uh, and I said, that's God. We prayed for miracles or the miracle of medicine or however you fix it. And that's a straight miracle. Because now we can work on our heart. We don't have to worry about them blood clots. And they're just like, oh, grace of God. I'm like, no, you don't understand. I am seeing it right now, laying right there. And she's still out. <laughs> I haven't even got to talk to her yet. But I know we're, we're, we're going in the right direction and things are okay, you know. Because, I'm, I'm not kidding, I feel like he told me, watch what I can do. And I don't even remember what day it was, Tuesday. Took her off the machine, and in an hour and a half, they put her back on and said, oh, you know, everything's right where we want it to be. The next day, they take the tube out. What, within 10 minutes, she's sitting up, talking, eating ice, and just, like, turned right back around out of it. And it's a miracle of God. Miracles still happen every day. I know. <laughs> no matter what you're going through, no matter what you're dealing with, you just give it over. God knows it already. He just wants that communication with you. And those struggles or anything you're fighting, He'll listen. Um, I mean, I guess you read about miracles every day and the healing power of prayer and everything and, and to come back into the church and to hear about the people that were there on Friday at four o'clock or whatever time they met and them talking about the Holy Spirit moving. And he's moving through that church. 
she's laying there, dang near died on me. And then he's telling me, I got it. I, I don't know, I, I don't know that I ever want to experience the, the tragic side of that again, but the side of it that comes with the joyous tears is it was amazing. Everything was amazing. And the steps that we've made, we, <laughs> the steps that she's made since that point are just, it's, it's out of this world. And not only is she fine and no side effects, they're in church today. Can we give up for Russell and JJ? Come on, stand up. Stand up, come on. Come on, that's awesome. I love you guys. Dead for 14 minutes. Do you hear me? No oxygen to your brain for 14 minutes. They should have given up. God said, not yet. And blood clots all in her lungs. And they said, we don't know what happened to him. And Russ goes, I, I, I do. <laughs> I know exactly what happened. It's God. It's God. I'm in that same hospital two weeks later with my friend of mine, uh, Chad Welsh. And we're praying for another miracle. And Chad dies. So again, God does miracles. Can, often done, and sometimes he doesn't. Does that make me waver in my faith? No. Not even a little bit. Because I've lived long enough and I follow Jesus long enough to know that I don't believe God based on what he does. I believe God on based on who he is. On who he is. I know who he is. And yes, sometimes he can, he often does. But he doesn't always do a miracle. Sometimes he shows up and he shows off in the most grand way. And it is awesome. And sometimes he says, I'm not going to prove myself. Sometimes our faith can stir the heart of God and he intervenes in a big way. But he goes, I'm not going to do it if it interferes with God's ultimate plan. Because there's something that's, that's better for you. I know this doesn't look better, but you just got to trust me. I've got something better. I talked to a mother who lost both of her babies in a car accident decades ago after the first service, and she started telling me all the good things, all the God's ultimate plan kind of thing. It's hard in that moment to go, God, what are you up to? But she says, I saw it within a year. I saw God moving, and, and I can see his ultimate plan in my life. Sometimes he, he, he has a better, a better plan. I'm not gonna trust you based on what you do. I'm not gonna believe in you based on what you do. I'm gonna believe in you based on who you are, your character and your nature and what you did for me on the cross. By the way, Jesus went to the cross and part of the reason he went to the cross was for your healing. By his stripes were healed, Isaiah says, but that's not the primary purpose. The primary, the highest purpose of Jesus going to the cross was for, to save your soul. That's why he went. I wanna die for you to save your soul. And I know there are people here today that have never placed your faith in Jesus. And today is the day you need to do so. You say, God, I'm surrendering to you. I believe you gave your son, Jesus. He lived a life on earth perfect, not because he was perfect, because it was easy. It was hard. He was tempted in every way I was tempted, Hebrews tells us. But he yielded his life to you, and then he took on my sin. He took on everybody's sin in the whole room, and he died for that sin so that I wouldn't have to. He was buried and he rose again, and I want to give my faith to you, put my hope and trust in you because you gave your life for me. I'd love for you to bow your heads and close your eyes in this moment. If that's you and you say, I need Jesus, you can confess that and believe that in your heart. You'll be saved today. I'm telling you, if you're watching online, you'll be saved today. You just got to say it and believe it. Romans 10, 9 tells us. Just repeat something like this after me. Just say something like, Lord Jesus, I believe you came to earth to die for my sins. I believe you were buried and rose again. And I'm giving my life to you today. Save me. Forgive me, even of the sins I haven't done yet. And be my king. I'm asking you to lead my life from this day forward. I'm taking myself off the throne and putting you right where you rightfully belong.
with your heads bowed. I know there's some of you that have been believing for a miracle. God, I just pray that you would grow our faith today. I pray that this story of Russell and J.J. Wall would grow our faith. We'd see you moving, not in Rwanda or Uganda, but right here with somebody in the service with me. And if you can do it for them, God, you can do it for me. Grow our faith because faith moves the heart of God. If we have faith like a mustard seed, mountains in our lives might be moved. And I pray, Lord, I want, I want miracles to happen within these walls, not to give me or our church any glory, to give you the glory that people all over this town will start talking about what's happening here at Colonial Hill Baptist Church because of what you're doing. Miracles, God, miracles. We're believing and receiving they're gonna happen in Jesus' name because in Jesus' name, with man it's impossible, not with you. All things are possible with you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. If you prayed the prayer of salvation today, I would love for you to text me the word saved to this number. It's going to give me a text asking for your physical address. It's going to send you a text back. And if you'll fill that out for me, I will send you a resource in the mail this week. No no strings attached. Just want to help you. I want to bless you. Okay.